Hi, and welcome to Simcha, a celebration of life. I'm your host, Aaron Halevi. Nisbaum's kosher butchery was established in 1936. This traditional family butchery continues to be run generation after generation by the Lurie family. We hooked up with Ian and Sharon Lurie to gain a better understanding of the different cuts of kosher meat and how they go about preparing them. My late father bought the business from the Nussbaums in approximately 1974. So the business has actually been in our family name for in excess of 30 years. I'm the second generation and my son Baruch is the third generation. Um, he joined us uh, three, four years ago and uh, his, his project is to take the business to the next level, the next dimension and offering a lot of a lot of convenience foods, uh, which in the past we haven't been strong with, which we are now developing. The first cut is the brisket. The brisket is probably one of the most popular cuts that we have in kosher, especially on the chagim, the yontifs, and uh, the brisket the way we've got it at the moment is on the bone and now we're going to debone it off the bone. As you can see the brisket is quite a fatty cut and uh, obviously the butcher can trim it lean or leave some fat on according to what the customer requires. It starts off at 5 to 10 kilos, by the time we've, we've trimmed it we end up with 3 kilos because we've taken the bones off and we're trimming it absolutely lean. The markings on top of the brisket actually show that it is kosher and shows the grade of the meat. The markings are done at the abattoir and are done with a vegetable dye which is edible um, to, so that we can identify that the meat is kosher and the grade of the meat and here we have a beautiful cut of brisket which is probably one of our premium cuts in the forequarter. Kosher meat somehow always got a bad rap. I don't know why because we weren't given the raw end of the stick, we were given the forequarter and they are the most delicious cuts on the forequarter. Whether it's brisket or stewing beef or what, whatever we use, mince, there are such delicious recipes that we can make. I'm going to start off with brisket and it's sort of on the breast of the cow and I use brisket a lot for um, cold meats and brisket is a very, very popular cut for all the Yom Tevin, for the Chagim on Rosh Hashanah, we make brisket with prunes and carrots and all that kind of thing. Um, I like to roast my brisket first. Sometimes I get it pickled. And as you can see, this, you know, I much prefer the, the piece on top. Yes, it does run different ways and it becomes difficult to cut when it's cooked. What I do is I just take that piece off and cut it against the grain and then I cut this one against the grain as well. You can pickle it, you have to get it pickled. Then you'd have to boil it before and then you can roast it if you want or you can just have it pickled and then it comes out like this, you know, this, use that for hot beef on rye. But if you roast it with a beautiful glaze, it just mm, takes it to another level. So you phone your butcher and you ask him for a pickled brisket. When it comes to always wash it very, very well. So this is, thank you, Clara, this is what you're going to get when you get a pickled brisket. So you see, it does look like a raw piece of meat, but you'll know because it will be in a vacuum packed bag or whatever, but that's what your pickled brisket will look like. Now, if you come in closer, you'll see the needle holes, and that is from the needles that have gone in to pickle the brisket. So now you take this home, and you wash it really well because you must remember that it's had a you know it's been in a bran and that is salty wash it very very well and then you boil it you boil it i would boil this for about two hours with some carrots and some bay leaves and peppercorns 
then you will have a cooked pickled brisket. If you want to, you can order a brisket that has been pickled and smoked. That, without the, um, the peppercorns on it. This is pastrami spicing, but it is done in the same way. It is pickled and then it is smoked and then you can slice it. So get your ordering right when you order a brisket. Remember, it's either fresh, it's either raw pickled, it's either cooked brisket, it's either smoked brisket, or it can be smoked, pickled and smoked as, and pastrami. Today we continue our mini-series, Heritage Travels with Hugh Reichlin. Hugh is a lawyer by profession and has been travelling the world over the last decade in search of interesting Jewish communities and stories. Today, he explores the history and culture of the Jewish community of Greece. The Jews came to Greece approximately 2,000 years ago, and in fact it is recorded in the Talmud that's the Jewish book of uh, law and history, that approximately 2,300 years ago, during the time of Alexander the Great, he had a vision that the Jewish people were praying for him that he should have success in his battles. And in fact, our rabbis record that he saw a vision of Shimon HaTzadik, one of the great luminaries of the Jewish world at that time. With the result, he didn't destroy Israel, and when he went on his conquests, he protected the Jews. Uh, out of respect for Alexander the Great and how great he was to the Jewish people, many Jewish families named their sons in that generation Alexander. When we went to Greece, we went to a place called Corinth, which is just uh, about just uh, south of Greece, just below Athens. And when we were there, we saw one of the oldest synagogues in the world. In fact, Paul of Tarsus, one of the disciples of Jesus, gave his first sermon in one of the synagogues in Corinth. And in fact, you can go there today and we saw the walls of the synagogue still standing. Thessaloniki is at the top of the country, right up in the north, and that always had the biggest Jewish community in Greece. Paul also spoke in the synagogues of Thessaloniki. Uh, in, a, in the year, I think it was around 50 of the common era. So there are links with the early Christians and the early Jewish community in Greece. The earliest group of Jews that came across to Greece came there about 2,000 years ago. So that was the time that we're talking about now with the birth of Christianity. And there's been an unbroken presence of Jews in Greece for the past remarkably 2,000 years. In Thessaloniki, in about 1941, there were approximately 60,000 Jews. They say between 60 to 70,000 Jews. And in fact, before the Second World War, they say almost half of the population, at least a third of the population of Thessaloniki, was Jewish. And they were so involved in the community, uh, in fact, they even called it Irva M. Le Yisrael, the Jerusalem of the Balkans. And Thessaloniki was a major port in the north of Greece that really linked many of the Balkan states. And the harbour was closed on the Sabbath, was closed on Saturdays, because so many of the stevedores and people that were involved in the harbour were Jewish. In fact, there's a joke, and I think it might even be true to say, that the harbour was closed on Fridays because of the Muslim population, the harbour was closed on Saturday because of the Jewish population, and Sunday because of the author of the Greek Orthodox uh, community. And yet, with the four days that they had, they were the busiest port in the Balkans and ran a very, very successful economy. There are two synagogues that are still operating today in Thessaloniki. The main synagogue is situated in an office block uh, in the middle of the town, and it's called the Yad Lezikaron Synagogue. When we were there, there must have been about 30 or 40 congregants, mainly old people. And Rabbi Shitrit uh, leads the congregation of Yad Lezikaron. He's in fact the only rabbi in Thessaloniki. 
He was sent out from Israel and was sent for a year or two and has landed up being there for about 10 years now and has really fallen in love with his community. Most of the congregants are Yavanic Jews. Those are the original Jews that we spoke about that have been in the country for about 2,000 years. Rabbi Shitrit also took us to another synagogue in Thessaloniki, which also operates, but it only opens for special occasions like a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah when young boys and girls celebrate coming of age. But it doesn't really function on a daily basis. What was so special about the Yad Lezikaron synagogue in Thessaloniki is that on the walls are many stones. They look like tombstones, but they're quite thin. They're made of marble. And they record the 60 synagogues that were operating in Thessaloniki before the Second World War. And each synagogue was named after the town or city or country from which those particular Jews came from. So you see names from Portugal, from Spain, from all over Europe, uh, where they remember all the different communities that kept their identity, kept their uniqueness, but were all together, all together comprised what was the special cosmopolitan city of Thessaloniki for the Jewish people. Before the 1940s, when the Holocaust deprived uh, the world of 80% of the Thessaloniki Jews who were deported to Auschwitz, it was a very vibrant city and the Jews had a major role to play in the economy and almost every aspect of the community. There were about 50 Jewish newspapers. They spoke Ladino, French and Greek. Uh, there were about 50 Jewish day schools and they had a tremendous infrastructure. In fact, uh, when we went to the museum in Thessaloniki, the Jewish museum, we saw that they had many of the communal organizations that we are familiar with in South Africa today. So there was WITSA, which is the Women's Zionist Organization. There was Maccabi, which today we know, and it still is uh, the Jewish sports organization and has the Maccabi games in Israel. There was Mizrahi, the religious Zionist group, and there was Beitar, uh, the Likudniks which are the more right-wing uh, Jewish uh, organization, uh, very strong Zionist traditional Jews. And to this day, there are still Jews there, so that means that they are probably the oldest Jewish community uh, in Europe today. When we went to Greece, we started in the south of the country at Athens, and we took a bus ride right up the country and went through the town of Yonina. Now, Yonina had a very large community of Yavanic Jews. Now, who were the Yavanic Jews? They were the first group of Jews that came to Greece, and their prayers were, they prayed in, in Greek, using the Greek language, but the lettering in their sidurim, in their prayer books, was actually written in Hebrew letters. So. They were the first of three groups, three major groups of Jews that came to Greece, the Yavanic group. The second group were the Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim comes from the word Ashkenaz, which means Germany. And they were Jews that came to Greece in about 1368. And they came mainly from Germany, from Hungary and from France. So they emigrated to the country in the late 1300s. That was the second group to comprise the Greek Jewish community. And the third group that came were the refugees from Spain and Portugal. And as we know, there was the Inquisition in Spain and Portugal. In about 1492, they were expelled from Spain, 1497 from Portugal. And a number of those Jews trekked across Europe and went to Greece. And when we went to Yonina, we met a lady by the name of uh, Mrs. Matza, and uh, she was telling us that they found graves going back to the early 1400s with Spanish inscriptions in Yonina that are still there after some 600 years. They have the largest synagogue in the Balkans, and they still have about 13 uh, or 15 Jews approximately that still live in Yonina today. Yonina is like the Stellenbosch of, uh, of South Africa. It is a university town. And she was telling me that a number of the Jewish people in Yonina are professors at the university in Yonina. 
there is a fascinating story as well, a true story, of the Jews of Zakynthos. Zakynthos is an island just off Greece, and it is a story of great courage and heroism. The bishop of uh, Zakynthos was Bishop Christmos, and there was also the mayor of the island by the name of Mayor Carrer. The Nazis in the early 1940s came to the island of Zakynthos and gave the archbishop and the mayor an ultimatum that the next day they had to have all the Jews of Zakynthos lined up at the harbour so that they could be deported to Auschwitz. The next morning, the only two people that were at the harbour was Bishop Christmas and Mayor Carrer. And they said to the Nazis, we are the only Jews on the island. And the bishop even said to them, and if you put us to death for what we're doing, please do not shoot us because it's against Greek Orthodox law. Please hang us because that is what is permissible in Greek Orthodox law. As a result, they did not hand over the Jews. The Nazis were so shocked that they left them. And to their credit, they saved the entire island's Jewish population. Unfortunately, 80% of the Greek community were murdered in the Holocaust and were deported in trains from Athens and from Thessaloniki and taken to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Many of the Greek Jewish men were used for menial labor. And the reason was that the Greek men were, many of them were working, as I said earlier, in the harbor. They were stevedores. Many of them were boxers. The Jews were very well known. The Greek Jews were very known for boxing and for sport. And they were very strong and physical. The Nazis identified these Jews by their strength and used them in a group called the Zonderkommandos. The Zonderkommandos were Jewish prisoners that were used in Auschwitz to take the bodies out of the gas chambers and to put them into the crematoria and then afterwards to take the ash out of the crematoria and bury it elsewhere. In 1943, the Greek Jews rebelled and they managed to smuggle dynamite through some ladies that were working in another part of the camp and brought it into the crematoria and they blew up four of the crematoria and killed three Nazi guards at the same time. It was a very brave effort, but it unfortunately was doomed from the beginning because there were problems in the Jews identifying the call to rise. There seemed to have been some sort of misunderstanding. The alarm was raised and the Nazis came in with dogs and machine guns and murdered several hundred Jews. However, the Greek Jews were very proud of what they had done, and those that survived stripped garments of blue and white and made a Greek flag and flew that flag as proud Greeks and Jews that managed to rebel and do what they could to destroy the German machine, the murdering machine of the Germans that was Auschwitz. Today in Greece, they have a Jewish day school in Athens. They also have a Jewish day school in Thessaloniki. When we went to Athens, we saw a very beautiful Jewish day school. It only goes up to the end of primary school and for high school, many of the Jews, Jewish students have to leave and go to Israel. And it was very heartwarming to see what devoted teachers they have. And they teach these Jewish children about their heritage and about Israel, and they teach, teach them Hebrew. And we walked, we walked around the school and we felt a tremendous connection to all of them, uh, because you just see a diaspora community that are proud Greeks and contributive uh, people in the Greek economy and in the Greek uh, state and nation, but at the same time work so hard to preserve their unique uh, and individual identity and religion. In the Jewish calendar, the month before Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is a time of reflection and introspection. The month of Elul offers us an opportunity to prepare our hearts for the Yamim Noraim, 
the days of awe. Over the next few weeks, Rabbi Masinta will explore the process of how we can reflect on the year gone by, sensitize ourselves to any mistakes we may have made, and strive to restore our integrity for the year ahead. Rosh Hashanah is a multi-dimensional day. On the one hand, it's a coronation ceremony. We come to God and we sound the shofar and we ask God to be our king yet again. And commensurate to us sounding the shofar and committing to being God's subjects, to serving God, commensurate to that will be God's involvement in this world. But Rosh Hashanah is also a day of judgment. This coming Rosh Hashanah 5,776 years ago, God would have created man. And God has put man in this world in order to serve him. And on Rosh Hashanah, God will look at the year that has just gone by and judge each and every one of us to see if we have been serving him the way we're supposed to. Well, what happens if we have messed up during the year? What happens if we've mucked it up unintentionally or intentionally? Comes along the Torah and assures us that there's a mitzvah of tshuva, a mitzvah, a mitzvah of repentance. And that mitzvah is very simple. To acknowledge what one has done wrong and to apologize to the one you've hurt and to apologize to Hashem. To apologize to God and simply by regretting what one has done wrong and not wallowing in guilt but standing up and acknowledging that each and every one of us are creations by God and every day that we're living we have to be serving him and continuing with our life and building that is the mitzvah of tshuva you know the first person to really bring destruction to the world was undoubtedly Cain he killed his brother Abel but the Torah goes on to tell us that Cain built cities and named them after his son. Commentary discussing the story says, why does the Torah tell us that Cain built cities and named them after his son? The Torah is not a history book. The commentary explains because the story of Cain is teaching each and every one of us who's messed up in life a very vital lesson. And that is, after Cain sinned, he apologized he stood up, but he didn't allow himself to wallow in guilt. He understood that he did wrong, but he went on to do that what God wanted him to do. And so too to each and every one of us. If we have mucked up, we dare not allow ourselves to wallow in guilt. We dare not allow ourselves to stay down. We learn from the lesson of Cain. We stand up. We build our lives. We build others. And we make this world into a dwelling place for God. This week's segment of Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, is taken from the 15th verse of chapter 5. There are four types among those who sit before the sages. The sponge, the funnel, the strainer and the sieve. The sponge absorbs all. The funnel takes it in at one end and lets it out the other. The strainer rejects the wine and retains the sediment. The sieve rejects the coarse flour and retains the fine flour. That's all we have for this week's episode of Semcha, a celebration of life. We'd love to hear from you, so send us a message on Facebook at Spirit Sister Productions. From me, Aaron Halevi, and the team, we wish you a great week ahead. See you next time. <laughs>